thank you all for coming for what I believe is our last Brookings lecture of the semester already. Uh, but we're hard at work scheduling our scholars and our lecture series for next fall and spring, so you'll be hearing about those uh, very shortly. And so I don't have a next lecture to announce, but uh, so we'll get right to work. Uh, since it's our last lecture of the year, I won't do a big commercial for our new book <laughs> called America's New Swing Region, which is a series of papers uh, by both Brookings scholars and uh, outstanding social and political scientists around the country that look at this part of the country and how it's changing political uh, status given that we, some of the states have, as we know here in Nevada, have picked up congressional seats, uh, the redistricting issues. It's, it's a very good snapshot of this region. So if you're interested, there'll be flyers for it on the way out. And just for Bob Lind, it even includes color graphs for you all to follow. Uh, but let's get on to the business of tonight, which is to welcome our colleague Adele Morris back to UNLV. Adele's a fellow in the Economic Studies program at Brookings. Uh, she's a, a frequent guest out here. She's uh, engaged in our community. She speaks to a number of classes, uh, undergraduate and graduate. Uh, she's engaged with business people in our community, collaborating with faculty, including Brad Wimmer from Economics, who's here somewhere. There's Brad. Uh, uh, as well as Helen Neal, who's, who's here. So Adele is a, a poster person, I won't say poster child, <laughs> for what we want our, our Brookings scholars to do. And tonight we get to hear her talk on the U.S. tax system, where do we go from here? That, We'll probably cover, what, the first five minutes of the, of the? <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do with the rest of your time. Maybe we'll, we'll, you can tackle the deficit and immigration with any time you have left over, okay? Uh, Adele brings a, a very interesting perspective to this. While she's a Brookings scholar, prior to that, she spent time at uh, OMB. She's, she's been in the Treasury Department, uh, so she's got a wide range of experience to bring to this critical issue. I know you'll have questions for her, so I'll let her get started. Adele? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And the last time I was here, or one of the previous lectures I, I gave was on climate policy. And um, so, this time I thought I would try something less controversial and go, <laughs> go for the tax system. Um, you know, there's something about me I like intractable problems. Um, what I'm hoping to do in this lecture is kind of give, give you a, a, a sort of foundation for thinking about tax policy. We know there's lots of um, arguments and controversies and debates. A lot of the media coverage is kind of more like keeping score, like you know, who's ahead in this particular game, but less actually talking about the content of the controversies and how to think about the important trade-offs that are embedded in our fiscal system. So that's kind of want to give you the foundation and, and, the, and some tools to think about this. Let's see now if I can, there we go. All right, wait, before I go, there, okay, so, um, I'm going to draw the data and some of the graphs from, from other sources, and here's some further reading. I also want to pay special tribute to my colleague, Tracy Gordon, who helped me with some of these slides. Um, the, the opportunity for you, after this lecture in particular, is when people are around the lunch table or the water cooler debating tax policy, then you can go with your smartphone and say, well, that's an empirical question. And <laughs> go on to the website and see, well, really, what do re rich people pay as a share of taxes or whatever? And then you can opine with great authority having done so. So the outline of my talk, and like I said, I'm gonna give you some basic facts of the fiscal system. Then think about, well, what are some of the problems we might be trying to solve if we did have a tax reform? And uh, talk a little bit about the proposals that have been floating around. I'm not going to get into the gory details, and you can do that after you have all these tools that I present. 
So first, let's stipulate what is a tax. A tax is an involuntary payment to the government to fund collective provision of goods and services. We're, we're distinguishing a tax from other payments to the government that might be for a specific service. And this is an important distinction when you think about state and local uh, revenues. For example, if I, if I uh, pay for garbage collection, and it's a separate fee that you may not consider that a tax, but rather a payment for a service. So we're talking about collective provision of, of uh, services. And I'm going to ma mainly talk about federal taxes here. i got to confine myself to an hour. That's going to be hard enough. And so the big, the big animals in the pen are personal income taxes, payroll taxes, corporate income taxes, and estate taxes, and that's kind of in the order of importance. So the fiscal facts, we're going to start there. So if we're going to talk about where we go from here, we have to know where here is. And so we're going to look at some facts on spending and revenues and what we mean when we're talking about deficit and debt, and look at some both historic data and some projections. So this is, these, these are a set of graphs of the US federal budget. The green bars are spending levels. The blue bars are federal revenue levels. Um, and we're starting back here at 1971. And the deficits are those little yellow bars right above the blue bars. Now, one of those data points you see had a surplus. In 2001, very briefly, we ran a federal surplus. And I remember those years because the Treasury had an unusual problem of trying to figure out how to buy back its own bonds because we had a surplus. And nobody knew how to do that because we, <laughs> we hadn't done it. Uh, that was a problem that did not last very long. Um, and now our yellow bar, there it is, in 2011 um, is, is really large. Now notice this is scaled as a percent of gross domestic product. What we think about when we talk about taxes is how big they are as a, as a share of the overall size of the economy. Because even if you just do it um, inflation adjusted, it's a little tough because the economy's been growing. So we want to think about how big is the federal footprint, if you will, on the overall economy. So we've got a big deficit. And um, it's big by historical standards as a share of the economy. So let's talk about the, let, we're, I'm going to talk now about the green, the green bar. See that one in 2011. What comprises it? Well, that white, that little white wedge at the top is the payments the federal government makes on interest of the existing debt. So as if, if we have Deficits that keep accruing, the overall debt, which is the aggregation of our deficits, gets bigger. And so then that white wedge gets bigger as a share of the overall uh, necessary spending of the federal government, because we have to serve that debt through our, our interest payments on treasury bonds. All those green wedges, and this is, this is from the CBO, by the way, um, are what we call mandatory spending. These are, these are things like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and other um, payments that, you know, if you qualify for that payment, you get it. Food stamps, that kind of thing, unemployment insurance. That mandatory spending is a huge chunk of our overall federal budget. I'm going to take questions at the end if you don't mind, but do do hold hold those and um, okay. And then the the discretionary spending is the brown and the the light tan. The dark brown is defense, also a very big chunk, and the non-defense is everything else you think about when you think about whether it's infrastructure spending, like on highways on energy policy, on research and development, like cancer research is buried in that tan wedge. OK, so th most of the time when people think about federal spending, they're thinking about that tan wedge and how we can shrink it. And they say, oh, government's really big. But really, the biggest footprint is in 
those green, sometimes we call those transfer payments. That's a lot of, of what we spend our money on. Now, where does our revenue come from? Okay. Individual income taxes, I know we're getting close to tax day here, um, are the light blue wedge. That's going on 50% of our total revenue uh, source. Now, again, this is federal government. If you're looking at state government or local governments, you're going to have a very different composition of the revenue sources. And then the social insurance taxes, that's again Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes. Um, that's the other big chunk. Corporate income taxes are actually pretty small. So when people talk about, oh, we're going we're gonna to change corporate income taxes, you'd have to change them quite a bit to make a big difference in the overall uh, picture there. And then, then the stark blue edge includes basically everything else. That's excise taxes, the, you know, the gas tax, the state taxes, pretty much everything else. So when you're talking about tax reform, you're really talking about income tax reform, changes to the social insurance programs, and maybe some corporate income tax reforms. Those are the, the big dogs you got to talk about. So if we're going to do a tax reform, what might be some of our goals? Okay, And here are at least four questions. The last two I'm going to kind of smush together. The first one is, how much revenue should we raise? How do we think about what the right amount of revenue our tax system should raise? And that gets to, you know, how much spending we're going to do and how, you know, what balances do we strike? Second, is it fair? How do we think about fairness? What are, what are some of the issues that arise when you want to make a tax system fair? Third is what kinds of ways can a tax system affect people's behavior. And I'll give you some examples, but there are really important ways that the way you tax something can shift around people's consumption or, or labor supply, and that changes the way the tax um, affects the economy. It's not just about raising revenue. Okay? And then the question of complications. That one I'm going to give a little short shrift to, but it is kind of part and parcel to all the ways um, incentives are created by the tax system, including the incentive to not comply at all because it's too much trouble. So, okay, so let's grapple with the do we need more revenue question. All right, so when we talk about limiting taxes, a lot of, there are folks um, who really want to limit taxes or, or provide tax cuts, not because they just don't like paying taxes, because none of us like paying taxes. It's really because they, there's a sort of a starve the beast idea, that if you keep taxes low, you're going to sort of, by extension, keep spending low. And there are folks who just believe in smaller government, so smaller taxes, in theory, could lead to smaller spending. But right now, unfortunately, uh, from the point of view of these folks, we haven't made progress in spending cut proposals. So at the moment, if you are in favor of lower taxes, it's basically been, yeah, well, we're going to end up with more deficits. And that's pretty much what happens. So here's been a, um, this is from the Congressional Budget Office, a great source of data on these things. And this is the federal deficit since 1972. This looks, remember the graphs I was showing you earlier. The blue is the deficit each year from 1972 onward. There's that little peak over there, that short period of surpluses. And then the part I want to show you is this was our deficit during the economic downturn. Some of that was deficit spending from the fiscal stimulus package, which everybody's heard so much about. But a lot of that deficit just came because the economic activity declined in the recession. So the less activity there is, the less income tax there's going to be, uh, less corporate income tax there is. And so revenue just shrinks at the same time the economy shrinks. So there were a lot of confluence, uh, it was a confluence of events that led to that. It wasn't just the stimulus spending, okay? Now here's, here's an important trend there. Okay, so the blue shape up there 
is CBO's projection, where this is going out to 2022. So this is usually about 20 year projection. Now the blue deficits are a lot smaller than this tan area called alternative fiscal scenario. But the blue says, what happens if the current law plays out just as the law is written right now? So as the law is written right now, there are a bunch of tax cuts that are going to expire. And um, there are certain Medicare payments to doctors that are going to shrink. Okay? So CBO, by law, does these projections where they assume the law is the law and that's how it's going to be. But they also do this thing called the alternative fiscal scenario, which is arguably mo a more probable outcome because each year Congress has extended uh, the tax cuts and Congress has extended the inflation adjustment of the alternative minimum tax, one of our favorite, favorite things if you're, if you're in the high income tax brackets. So when, so my point for this chart is whether you're worried about future deficits kind of depends on how you think things are going to play out. Is it going to be current law or are there going to be changes that we have seen consistently continue to be made in the law? And if so, the deficit projections are pretty serious, even by historical standards. And again, this is as a percentage of GDP. Now, that was deficits, right? Now I'm looking at debt, which again is the sort of accumulation of years and years of deficit. And we also care, remember that white wedge I was showing you? That's the interest payments. So if, as the debt gets bigger, we have to start worrying about that. And again, so here's the debt as a percent of GDP. It was relatively low as the economy was booming in the 90s and it was going down. But then what we saw with the, with the deficits I was showing you early, earlier, the debt to GDP ratio skyrocketed. And then what happens next depends on which of those scenarios I showed you before plays out. If the alternative fiscal scenario um, materializes, man, that debt to GDP is set to go way up to levels of, you know, that we haven't seen since the World War II era. So when people are talking about the deficit and the debt and the, all that stuff, and again, there are, there are some other issues with regard to demographic changes and baby boom retirement. So if you took that out even further, it, it can get even scarier. So that's why people are all torqued up about making a change is because they're worried about that scenario. And I, I mentioned what the alternative fiscal scenario is, um, and I think I mentioned all of those. So why do we care about debt? I mentioned the size of the white wedge, but there's other reasons to care. And that's because the more debt that U.S. Treasury issues, the less money goes into alternative productive investments. So that's less capital accumulation and potential economic growth from those investments. Who's buying our debt? A lot of debt is held by foreign governments and that carries its own kind of sensitivity in international relations. We may not like the outcomes of being beholden to others for, for uh, buying our debt. We don't know how long they'll be interested in buying our debt. The, the more debt we issue, the less option we have if a crisis emerges and, you know, maybe there's a, a, a military conflict or some other need to spend, we will have kind of, um, you know, spent what we had and, and then we'll be sorry we did it later. Um, so for all of those reasons, uh, people, people are concerned about the debt and, and, and the question arises, well, can we, can we afford to do something about it? Where does this debt come from? Um, well, a lot of it, you can see, this is from the, the Peterson Foundation. A lot of that uh, projected growth in the spending is going to be from health care programs. And, and that blue wedge at the top is interest payments that I was showing you before. 
So that orange wedge is why everybody fixates on healthcare, because that's the, that's the one massively growing uh, or likely to grow wedge. Everything else is set to decline as a share of GDP. So uh, that's why you keep hearing about healthcare. Now, how taxed are we? There is this sentiment that, gosh, we're a high tax economy. But really, as a share of GDP, we're at a relatively historic low in terms of overall federal taxes as a share of GDP. This is a graph that goes from 1950. You can see it's bounced around a little bit. Um, but this goes out to 2010. You can see, as a share of the economy, taxes are, are not as big a bite as they have been in the past. So some argue from this that there is scope for a little bit more tax burden. Whether it's a good idea or not, again, you'll, you'll have to decide. But certainly, by historic standards, we're not in a high tax um, context. And also, compared to other economies, we're relatively uh, low tax. So for example, here's the US um, total tax burden relative to, the, again, GDP. Um, OECD average, this is kind of the group of, of uh, developed economies, is about 35%. So the US is comparatively relatively uh, modest tax burden. OK, so I've shown you the potential need for revenue. Now I'm going to talk about another potential motivation for reform, and that's the thought about equity. OK. So I'm going to help you think about, well, how do you think about equity in a tax system? What does fairness mean? And show you some facts and figures. So there are two main ways to think about it, whether a tax system is fair or not. One is called horizontal equity. That is, are two individuals fairly equally situated socioeconomically, are they going to have fairly equal tax burdens? Or is there some way in which we're picking on one and leaving one out? OK, that's horizontal equity. Vertical equity is the idea that as people move up the socioeconomic ladder, they can bear a higher percent of their income in tax burdens um, uh, because they can afford it, sort of the ability to pay idea. Okay, And we often talk about uh, tax burdens as the effective tax rate, how much you pay as a percent of your income. And progressive taxes are one where the percentage of your income you pay goes up with your income. Proportional is where it's like flat, the percentage is flat. Um, people with lower income pay less, but they pay the same as a proportion of their income than rich people in a proportional world. And then a regressive tax is one that proportionately hits lower income people harder. So in general, when people think about equity, they think of a progressive tax system. And to give you an idea of how we do that in the income tax system, we have these marginal rates. So for the first x dollars of your income, you pay one percentage level. And then as your income goes up, you pay a higher marginal rate at different tax brackets. So that's single on the left, and that's married on the right. And you can see that, of course, the tax brackets are different because married filing jointly, you're thinking they're going to be you know, higher aggregate household income there. But just imagine, OK, just to illustrate how hard it is to have both horizontal and vertical equity, imagine two people, a couple, if they're unmarried, let's say they both make $70,000, OK? So together, their income is $140,000. If they're not married, OK, they each pay a marginal rate of 25%, OK, if they're not married. Let's say they decided to get married, OK? So their combined income is $140,000. What's their marginal rate going to be? It's going to be 28%, OK? So it's intrinsically difficult to come up with a system 
that's vertically equitable, but also doesn't end up inadvertently penalizing one person or another based on some of their choices, and here it's the choice to get married or not. Okay, this is one illustration, but there, there are a whole bunch of other examples. Whether you buy a house or not, you know, whether you rent or own, all kinds of decisions you make affect your tax burden. Okay, so let's ask the question, well, how much more in taxes do rich people pay? And for some reason, the $1 million mark has gotten some, some play. So this is average effective tax rates for various income groups, okay? This is um, adjusted gross income, but just that's fine. It's as good as anything. Okay, how much tax you pay? So everything to the right of that red line are people that make more than a million dollars a year. And you can see as a percentage of their income, for the most part, they pay more than the folks who make a lot less. It may not be as progressive as some people would like, especially on the very high end. The very high end, actually, the tax rate falls. And part of that is because people at the very high rate tend to have more capital gain income, which is taxed at a lower rate. So they end up with a lower effective tax rate. So of course it depends on how you get your money, what you end up with your overall tax uh, liability. So, but tends to be progressive by the standard I just showed you. Another way to think about it is what share of total income by, of everybody do, does rich, do, do rich people make, okay? So the red bar, and the first red bar is the share of total pre-tax income made by, by <laughs> different categories of income, okay? So for example, the top quintile, which is the top 20% of earners, makes 55% of all pre-tax income in the United States. That's this, this red block in the first, in the first bar. They pay 70% of all taxes federal taxes. So they make a little over half the income, but they pay a little over 70% of total income. Now, if you were watching the progressive tax structure, that, that's the progressive tax structure in action right there. Okay, and then the bottom quintile, which is the bottom 20% 20, 20 of households, pay 4% of taxes, federal taxes, and essentially an indistinguishable share of, I mean, uh, they earn 4% of income and indistinguishable, indistinguishable share of federal taxes. Different taxes have different incidents, different, different levels of progressivity. You saw, um, you can see some of that with the income tax. This is that, remember that marginal rate chart I was showing you with married and single people? That's this in action. Payroll taxes, however, tend to be more evenly distributed because that's a share of, of your salaries. And it's constant no matter how much salary you make up to a certain cap. Corporate income tax tends to hit the highest income folks more. And then there's the overall tax system. Okay, so let's keep moving. Now, okay, so yes, it's progressive, but how's the progressivity changed over time? This goes from 1960 to 2004, and it shows the trend. People think, well, taxes have gone up, it's gotten worse. Well, in actual fact, it hasn't. So the highest earning 0.1% of taxpayers pays a smaller share of their income than they did in 1960. So a lot of people, when they're talking about tax reforms, think about expanding this graph so that more taxes are paid by those folks at the very top. Okay, so I, I wanna make one quick point here, and that is when you think about who pays a tax, okay, there's what the law says, who sends the check to the government. That's what we call the statutory incident. What does the statute say who pays? But then there's the economic incidents, and if you leave with one New idea, it's this. 
The statutory incidents and the economic incidents are two separate things. Think about this. When you pay your social security tax, half of it comes from your salary and half is paid by your employer. Okay. Do you think your wages are unaffected by the fact that your employer has to pay the government when they hire you? Of course not. Do you think that maybe your wages are a little lower than they otherwise would be given the fact that your employer is sending a check to the government for having employed you, right? So the economic incident says, so think about taxes as a hot potato. Everybody's going to pass them along until they can't pass them anymore. And uh, that goes for income taxes, payroll taxes, corporate taxes. There's a question. We think about corporate income taxes. We're going we're to, you know, it only seems right that corporations should pay their fair share. Well, who's bearing that? A corporation in the tax world is not a person. A stockholder is a person. A worker is a person. Who bears the corporate income tax is actually a matter of some research discussion. It could be that higher corporate income taxes mean that corporations pay lower wages, right? It could be that they pay stockholders less. Stockholders may get lower capital gains if corporate, corporate taxes are lower. So think beyond just like who's writing the check to who really is sitting there with the hot potato in their lap. So here's an example. This is a, just a simple example with a, a gas tax. You can't have an economics lecture without a supply and demand. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you. So, so the price of gas is on the vertical. The quantity of gas people buy is on the horizontal. Demand slopes downward. We like to think that. And supply slopes upward. How much it slopes down and how much supply slopes up. That, that is just, is, it depends on the market and all kinds of things. I'll show you ch a chart. So when you have a tax, the way to think about it is it puts distance between what the seller gets and what the buyer pays. Okay, so you can love, you can um, impose the tax on the seller or you can impose the tax on the buyer of gas, but who ends up actually paying just depends on the shape of those curves. Um, so here's another way to look at that. So I've got supply and demand, and what I need if I have a tax is, is what we call the tax wedge, that distance between supply and demand where the tax lies. <coughs> This gray area is what we call the dead weight loss. Okay, here's a, here's a way to think about a dead weight loss. Okay, the government's going to impose a tax on going across a bridge. Okay, so I'm going to go across the bridge and I'm going to pay that toll. Now, the guy behind me says, well, to heck with this. I'm not going to go across that bridge. I'm going to go the long way around and go across where there's no toll. So the cost to the economy of that person going around the long way, that's a real cost. Did it collect any revenue? No. So for every dollar of tax raised, there's some dead weight loss associated with it. If you put a tax on labor, maybe people work less. If you put a tax on gasoline, in actual fact, one point of a gas tax might be to discourage people from, from consuming as much gas. Certainly that's the idea with cigarette taxes and alcohol taxes. The whole point is to change behavior, at least to some extent with those. So, but the size of that triangle of dead weight loss and who ends up bearing the burden depends on the shape of those graphs. So when you're doing tax design, you want to be sure that you're trying to minimize the size of that dead weight loss, that triangle. So this is just graphically what I was saying earlier about taxes and labor supply. Okay, if you have no tax, then people are, then you're going to get no revenue, but you're not going to distort ta uh, people's labor leisure decisions. If you have 100% tax, nobody's going to work, so you're not going to get any revenue from a labor tax, right? So there's some kind of uh, inverse curve, 
thought of as the Laffer curve, that the higher the tax rate, eventually you're going to start lowering your, your tax revenue. But um, there's a lot of debate exactly about where that, where that downturn exists in different taxes. Now, one thing about corporate income tax, remember I was saying that really people bear corporate income taxes, not corporations, because they're not people. They don't have welfare. One of the big issues in corporate income taxes is the fact that because there's a corporate tax, when the corporation makes profits, okay, but, but then they pay dividends, and that's taxed again as income to the shareholders. So one of the things you're going to hear about any kind of corporate tax reform is what to do about the double taxation of corporate income. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? A lot of people think it distorts investment choices because you've got that layering on of taxes. Other people think, well, corporate taxes tend to be more progressive. We ought to take advantage and keep those rates high. There can be a trade-off between your equity goals and your efficiency goals. A corporate income tax might be an example of that. Okay, so just to sum up, if we want to reduce the cost of raising revenue, we want to have a broad base. We don't want to have, you know, a, a, a tax base full of, of holes like a Swiss cheese. We want to have, tend to have lower rates and limit tax expenditures, and I'll show you what some of those are, and tax the people who can't pass it on as a hot potato to somebody else. Okay, now that's if we want to reduce the cost of raising revenue. That's not necessarily if we want to be fair, okay? So uh, one of the conundrums of all of tax policy you'll see is, is this conflicting set of goals. Now a tax expenditure, what is that? Well, economists like this term because when we're spending money, we think we got a budget, you know, this is outflows from the government, this is spending. Well, a tax expenditure is just the flip side. This is where we're giving away revenue that we otherwise would collect. So it could be a, a charitable gift deduction. You can deduct that from your taxes. It could be any number of things. Um, according to this foundation, the, and, and the data that they used from the Tax Policy Center and the CBO, the composition of our tax expenditures is almost as big as how much tax we actually collect. So when you're thinking about the footprint of the federal government, don't just think about what we collect, think about what we give up and what that does to all the incentives. I'll show you examples of that. The very biggest tax expenditure is the fact that when when you get health care coverage from your employer, okay, usually you pay some of the premiums and your employer pays some of the premiums. In a way, if you think about it, I get some salary and I also get as part of my compensation my employer's contribution to my health care costs, right? That's another form of compensation. But when my employer pays for my health care premium, that's not counted as income when my income is taxed, okay? So I have a tax preference for compensation in the form of health care premiums over salary, okay, on the margin as a result of this tax benefit. Now, on the one hand, yes, you want employers to help people buy health insurance, but when you make it a tax-advantaged form of compensation, Arguably, what you're doing is encouraging people to consume more health care than they otherwise would. And so this is why, not just because it's a big dollar amount, it's, it's considered a distortion of consumption in favor of more health care spending. The other um, big ones, um, pension contributions uh, and, and contributions to 401k plans, that kind of thing. Another big one, $89 billion a year, is the deductibility of interest on your mortgage. Okay, again, just like I was saying about health care, arguably it leads to people consuming more and bigger houses than they otherwise would because they get this assistance from the tax system to help pay that mortgage. And it might distort decisions on the margin to rent versus own and that kind of thing. Well, if you believe 
that there's a social advantage to, to home ownership, you're going to think, okay, well, maybe that's, that's worth it. Is it worth $89 billion a year of lost revenue? Maybe, maybe not. Would getting rid of it have an effect on the housing market? Absolutely. So if they went after that number three mortgage interest to, to, to raise revenue, the number one people who are going to be opposed to that, aside from every homeowner in every congressional district, is going to be you know, the realtor folks and the, and the housing industry folks. Would you have to phase in um, a reduction in that deduction? Probably. And could you do it in this housing market? Yeah, good luck with that. But it's a lot of money, and arguably it's distortionary. And right now, you can deduct interest payments on mortgages up to a million dollars. So from an equity standpoint, you're having overall taxpayers and renters subsidize the housing choices of people who have million dollar mortgages. Put that on your equity scale and see what you think about it. Okay. So what do we do? Okay, we're going to try to wrap up here and have some discussion. Okay, there is no shortage of suggestions of what to do about our fiscal situation. How you make sense of them, I hope I've given you some tools, but there's, there's a grab bag of bipartisan uh, attempts out there to do something. Simpson Bowles, uh, also known as uh, the National Commission something something. Uh, okay, wait, I keep doing this. Okay, uh, this was the bipartisan commission put together by the president where he set it up so that if they could come up with a consensus, with a supermajority vote, it would carry the day. Well, they came up with a proposal, but it didn't get the supermajority vote. Um, a lot of people think it was a very uh, bold effort. Um, maybe it, the time wasn't ripe for it. There was another um, bipartisan effort called the Rivlin Domenici Plan. You'll hear those names. Um, Alice Rivlin actually is one of my colleagues at Brookings, and she also was involved in the Simpson Bowles process. The, the Rivlin Domenici Plan was put together by the Bipartisan Policy Center. It's kind of more of a, of a nonprofit. Um, uh, non-governmental endeavor. Also, very serious effort by very serious people, very sincere. They came up with the plan, um, had about as much traction as the Simpson Bowles. And now we're hearing a wide variety of proposals by the Republican candidates, and, and President Obama um, has had some of his uh, proposals. So here's a Here's kind of a rundown of some of the usual suspects. So, okay, so the red bars are how much spending would be cut in the proposal. The blue bars would be how much revenues would be raised in the proposal. Okay, the first column over there is Simpson Bowles. And it had kind of a balance between new tax revenues and spending reductions. The second column is from uh, Representative Ryan of the House Budget Committee. There is this picture up there. He might look familiar. He's from my home state of Virginia. Um, now, that kind of represents more what I would call the, the Tea Party uh, point of view, very high on the spending cuts and actually tax reductions, okay? So that probably represents one extreme of the, of the set of options. President Obama had a little bit more tax revenue than spending cuts, but still, you know, some balance there. And when he was in negotiations with um, Mr. Boehner from Congress, they kind of came out somewhere, perhaps not entirely surprising, between where Mr. Obama was in April and uh, the Ryan budget. So, okay, there, can't, there exists in theory compromises, although that one never took off. So, and then there are a couple others.
by other members of, of Congress. So, you know, you, there's something in there for everybody. The problem is you can only choose one thing, and what is it going to be? Here's another way to look at it. When I, remember I was talking about the very high income folks? So this is the range of what would happen in terms of dollars of tax liability for the top 1%. Um, President Obama would raise the tax liability of the top 1%. And there are some of the Republican candidates. Um, Mr. Romney, interestingly, of all the, the re, uh, Republican candidates in that list, would lower the tax liability of the top 1%, but by the least amount of all those Republican candidates. OK. All right. So um, I'm going to kind of skip this. This is a sort of a, a detailed snapshot of some of the uh, changes in the Simpson-Bowles uh, Commission's proposal. You can go in and see the gory details. This slide I wanted to include just to show you're going to hear a lot of talk about the defense budget. I just wanted to show you one shot from why certain um, proponents of tax and fiscal reform fixate on the defense budget. And this, this, is, this is very typical of, of the kind of arguments you hear. Add up all of the defense budgets of all those countries, including China and Russia and the UK, Japan, pretty much everybody else you can think of, and it's still less than the United States. So that's why you're, you're going to, I think, my prediction for what it's worth is you're going to hear a lot more about that. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. So another option is, then this is very controversial, is whether you're going to add a new revenue instrument. Remember, I was talking about all those big dogs. Could we add another dog? Um, the value added tax is one that comes to the top of the list. It was in the Rivlin Domenici plan. Um, I won't go into the details here, but it's basically like a sales tax at each stage of the supply chain. And um, they include it because it can raise a lot of revenue, and it's a common tax instrument used around the world. Um, so f some folks are thinking about a carbon tax. It could raise about a billion dollars a year at a level of about $15 a ton of CO2. Some people think we should be taxing bad things if you think of carbon. Well, carbon tax has two problems, carbon and tax. But uh, <laughs> if, you, if you think carbon is a problem and you want less of it, then taxing, is, taxing it is a way to do that. So just to conclude, uh, we've got arguably unsustainable levels of federal debt on the horizon if we don't do anything. Um, if you can't meet your spending reduction goals, you want to stick to no new taxes, you're going to be a yes new deficit person. Just that's the arithmetic. Um, it matters how you structure these taxes. If what you want to do is lower the cost of raising revenue, you want that broad base and, and, uh, under, and, and, and see the decline of those tax expenditures I show you. But you know, everybody's going to need good luck and goodwill to, to get this done. So I'll, I'll stop there and take some questions. Yes. On the slide with the green wedges and the tan wedges. Yes. The federal, or excuse me, the veterans benefits fell into both a green mandatory chart or tax and a discretionary tan band. Yeah, I, I wish I knew exactly okay. how those were parsed out. But trusting the CBO, I'm sure they're not double counting. One might be health care benefits and might some might be some other kind of disability <laughs> payments, for example. There are several departments that stand close in both bands. Well, one, one way they might divide it is which side of the, of the spending ledger it goes on. Is it mandatory, meaning that if you qualify for this benefit, you will get it? Or is it discretionary, meaning every time it has to go through the appropriations process and so it kind of just depends on the statutory nature of a particular benefit, which side it lies on. So you could, go, you could go to the CBO website, and I'm sure you can dig down. Also, the OMB would have this, because they have the, 
mandatory spending and discretionary, and you could look up in there and see the details. Yes. Hi, a great presentation, by the way. Thank um, you. The question that I have is in relation to the tax brackets for uh, the average homeowner or the average resident, um, unless your income is going to increase by $100,000 or more, um, is there really a true concern in relation to what tax bracket you're in? Because as I understand, everyone under 200 or 250,000 falls within a certain tax bracket and, and, uh, and up until you climb over that, then will you really feel the impact of the tax shift? So can you speak to that? Yeah. So that, yeah. So in the, in the table I showed you that showed you the marginal rates for singles and married, what you saw is that that incremental tax rate, this is for personal income tax, as you go up in your income, it does go up, right? So um, you might notice that as your income, let's say you got a big raise, you will see that the amount of dollars you get to keep out of your raise might be lower the higher your income goes, okay? Now, what you're referring to, I think, is this discussion of if we're going to raise more revenue from the personal income tax and we're going to do it by raising those top rates on the high income earners, where do you start in that distribution of income? Where, which bracket do you start raising that rate? Right? So if you're, if you're at a $100,000 income, I don't think I've heard any of the candidates say you're going to have your tax rate. Like, I'm talking about married filing jointly, okay? Now, they're, they're a little silent on certain points. Are they talking about gross income, adjusted gross income? Which deductions and exemptions are they talking about for this bright line below which nobody's getting touched? So back, um, gosh, it was a few years ago, it used to be everybody, so I think President Obama was saying everybody who's making under $250,000 a year married filing jointly, and that's about where the end of the details uh, uh, lie. Um, you were not going to be made worse off. But then above that you would. Now a million dollars is kind of what you hear about. Um, and, but, but that's not going to change the fact that there are increasing marginal tax rates even below that level. The question is which of those tax brackets is going to see yet a higher marginal tax rate if there's a reform. You got to follow up? Yes, real, real briefly. Um, today, the average um, citizen, whether they be in the public or the private sector, are not seeing any raises. Um, that would probably be true because that I can go back to that quintile chart yeah. I was showing you with the big red blocks, and the middle quintile I think was well below that threshold. So that would be a true statement. Okay. Yes, over there. Talk about the pros and cons of different types of taxes, and say the pros and cons of, uh, uh, of progressive versus uh, proportional type tax. But I don't hear much discussion of the rationale or the premises of uh, one type of tax uh, compared with another. In other words, I always, <clears throat> I've seen some uh, rationales put forward for why we should tax income. Right. Um, but uh, other, what rationales are put forward for sales tax or corporate tax or okay. property tax? Okay. So why do, why do we have all these tax instruments? And uh, what, what's the point of each one? And you know, how would you like compare a corporate? Right. It's a matter of talking in terms of fairness on what I right. can understand the fairness in income tax, but right. what, what's the premise, what's the rationale uh, in terms of fairness for a sales tax or right. uh, any other type of tax? Well, you know, 
I think a lot of what we see in our tax system is a function of decisions that were taken through the history of the U.S. tax system. Like we first got our income tax in order to fund World War II, and um, that we we had we had a need to fund uh, federal activities that that was that was a new entirely uh, exigent uh, circumstance that allowed for the acceptance of a new tax instrument in the form of a personal income tax at the federal level. Now, at each stage, then we had the payroll taxes that went to fund Social Security and Medicare when those were instigated. And I don't know exactly the timing of all that. So, you know, I would hazard to assert there's not one big grand rhyme and reason for the composition of our revenue instruments because we see in different countries have very different composition and even in different levels of our government like I said if you look at states they have very different tax bases some have income taxes some don't some have state level sales taxes some don't some have property taxes some don't and why is that? Does it make sense? Some of it is just the history of individual states. Alaska doesn't have an income tax. They even have a rebate to their citizens because they had natural resource, uh, natural resource revenues that, that obviated the need for income tax. Same in Texas for a long time. Um, so, you know, I wish there was some kind of rationale and maybe that's something we should be thinking about when we do reform is like, how do we do it in a way that makes some logical sense across all our revenue instruments? I think that's the right kind of discussion to have. Politically, it doesn't seem to be the discussion we are having. <laughs> yes? I'll find another level. Um, I just wanna make a comment or um, see what you think about the relationship between the foregone tax revenue and spending. I mean, we don't put this together, but you can view uh, spending more than it is if you took into account the foregone revenues. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And if you talk to an economist who, who works on this stuff, they view tax expenditures as just an important a fiscal decision as a direct spending. And one of the frustrations is this is almost, um, you know, irresistible to Congress to put spending in the tax category instead of on the budget because it's less transparent, it tends to go through less rigors, it's buried in this already god-awful complicated tax system, it's hard to estimate sometimes exactly what the foregone revenue is as opposed to knowing exactly what you spend because it's in your budget and you've got appropriations that have to cover it. But economically, they're equivalent and we ought to be thinking about them both as we try to rationalize our fiscal system. Because yep. often people will complain that we don't spend enough on the welfare state in this country in comparison to other industrialized nations, but if you take into account the foregone revenue, well, we have we do the earned income tax credit, for yes. example, which is an important assistance to low income workers. And so, if you want to um, assess the overall magnitude of assistance to the working poor, you absolutely have to put tax benefits in there along with direct spending. Yes? According to the IRS data, uh, 25% of taxpayers pay 87% of the individual income tax. That's AGI above 66,000. One chart that I had with the red blocks in it. We can look at it. Now, that's not going to be just income tax. I don't. That includes payroll tax. Yeah. Let's see if I can do this. Regarding the income tax, because yeah. that is the IRS yeah. data. Yeah, it might be, I think that might be consistent with this chart. I'll just take your word for it, okay. not knowing the data. Uh, question then. Okay. Is it healthy for a democracy for that small percentage to be supporting the federal government? 
supporting um, that bigger share? You know, uh, we have very skew income distribution. It doesn't surprise me we have a skew revenue distribution. I think the alternative would be to have the very richest pay less and have middle income and poor folks pay more. Would that be a better outcome? You know, it's kind of your value system, but, but I probably would not make reforms that were regressive relative to the current system. If you're asking my opinion, I'm having trouble. Really likes the gas tax. The base broadening proposals seem to be based on that, although you had it as an efficiency. Well, the base broadening, I would. Okay, I'd make a distinction between the progressivity of the system and the base broadening. So, base broadening, what I'm talking about is eliminating what some people call loopholes the tax credits, the, the um, deductions, the the various kinds of tax favored spending. For example, let's say you want to encourage energy efficient uh, appliance purchases. Do you give people a tax credit or do you do something else? My first preference would be to take that out of the tax system. If you want to encourage energy efficiency, do it explicitly through the appropriations process or through some information campaign, I, I, I would, because that stuff basically lards up the tax system with all kind of complications that are, are uh, opaque and, and okay, I'll, you've heard me vent already. Mm -hmm. I would do, I would, if it were me, I would greatly simplify the tax system and eliminate as much as I could of all that stuff but then lower the rate that I would apply to it. This is probably why I will never get elected to anything, <laughs> but um, that, that's what I would, do. yes? Isn't that what Ronnie Reagan tried to do? And he did it? He yeah, did but, it? That, but then he had, yes. to, he had to pull back on the mortgage thing because there was too much of a backlash. Well, right, see, this is <laughs> predictable, isn't it? But yes, so, <clears throat> there, so we actually had a session on the 86 tax reforms at Brookings a panel that, that I, I sat on and I listened to some of the folks, the experts who were involved in that tax reform and it is exactly the kind of flavor that many people favor for now because it gotten complicated, more complicated, more complicated, simplified, more and more and more and more complicated. So it seems like every, you know, 30 years or so, We've just got to strip it all back and, you know, entirely predictable what will happen to it after that, <laughs> right? But maybe we can just do a reboot on the tax system, streamline it, reduce the distortions I was talking about, and maybe raise a little more revenue to kind of reduce the prospect of some of those scary fiscal outcomes. And, and, and get it done. And that would be the kind of, the kind of endeavor that, that it would require, would be what happened in 86. It's interesting to hear people talk about what happened at that time, and many of them were not at all sure they could get it through. So you mentioned the complexity. What is the cost of the economy of tax compliance for individuals and corporations, and everybody who pays? And wouldn't we be better off with a flat tax, a flat income tax, a, say a, a value-added tax or a flat sales tax? Yeah, so uh, the IRS does a lot of work on, you know, optimizing tax compliance, and, and, they, and they try really hard. But basically, no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, if you try to act, like, like I have a, a housekeeper, and I have to tell you, doing my taxes for my housekeeper, it, I just feel like, uh, you know, they have it in for me. It, it's almost as though they don't even want me to pay those taxes. And I feel like I must be the only person who complies with that because, you know, I feel thoroughly punished for it. But so what you're saying is um, 
I, I would say this to the idea of the flat tax. I don't think it's the progressive marginal rates that are causing the complication. It's all this other stuff in there. And you don't need a flat tax to streamline compliance. What you need is, is sort of a, a rational broadening of the base. And if you want to make it progressive, I think that's still consistent with simple. What do you think the cost is? 200 billion, 300 billion to the economy? Yeah, I hate to speculate, but I know where to look it up because there's a literature on this. Some, some economists, when they ask, well, what's the marginal deadweight loss of revenue in the United States? Um, which doesn't just include compliance costs, but all that gray triangle I was showing you before could be about 30 cents on the dollar. So every dollar you bring in can cost the economy an additional 30 cents. So that's, that's hefty. That's a hefty marginal dead weight loss. So whether that's right or not, I think depends on which tax instrument you're looking at. And, and, and so on. Yes? What odds do you give that there will be tax reform within the next five years? <laughs> 63.5%. No, that might, that might be an overestimate. I was like, I have no idea. But I, part of me is like this sort of civic-minded person who says, Gosh, those, those deficit projections worry me. We, we can't keep putting this off forever. We've got to have a dialogue about this, like kind of grown-up dialogue where we all make compromises from what our ideal outcome would be. And I, I just think it's got to be done. But then lots of stuff I thought had to be done hasn't been done. So, you know. Yes, you had your hand up. Last um, well, talking about tax, tax expenditures, uh, how much appetite is there if, by our leaders to actually go after some of that money, uh, specifically uh, dealing with internet taxation and, uh, and, and a broad-based national sales tax on, on internet transactions? And uh, what's, what's it looking like? Are they going to try to do this? And the power to tax being the power to destroy. And like you were saying, you know, if you don't like carbon, you tax it. Well, if you don't like commerce, you tax it. Yeah. So. Well, if you don't, if you don't like taxes, you gotta like, you, I mean, so, so we gotta fund the government. So, I, I mean, nobody likes paying tax. I don't like it either. But yes, yeah, so let me just address the internet tax question. So the issue at hand is, what do you do about sales taxes on transactions that are conducted over the internet? These are state level taxes. These are state sales taxes. The question is, where is this commerce occurring and should there be a sales tax liability? And folks such as Amazon will tell you it's not practical to collect sales taxes because they might have, you know, thousands of providers who reside in all sorts of different locations and untold millions of customers who all reside in different locations. And it's just not feasible. I'm not sure I believe the feasibility thing. And certainly, the, they're in tough competition on this idea with folks with brick and mortar uh, operations such as Walmart and Target who want to who wanna compete online with, with Amazon. So um, that battle is underway. But the revenue issues are for states and not the federal government. And, and so states have a vested interest in the outcome of that, of that discussion. Yes. Okay, I, for then. I am sorry. I always apologize for doing this, but we have Dell actually talking to a class at seven o'clock. So she's a, the hardest working scholar we have here. <laughs> when I took. <laughs> When I tell our Brookings colleagues Las Vegas is a 24-7 town, I don't think that's what they thought I meant, but that's, that's all right. Uh, thank you, Adele. Thank you all for your great questions. Keep your eyes open for our emails and announcements about our lectures and activities, and hope to see you soon.